All right, we're going to start in Genesis chapter number one. And uh, we're going to spend tonight uh, one, one more lesson dealing with some of the issues around image, because I think it's very important when God creates man and he talks about uh, making them in his image that we understand what's going on here. In chapter one of verse number 27, uh, verse 27 of chapter number one in Genesis, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So it says that God created man in his own image. And I wanted to run through a, a, a few verses here and deal with this issue of, of image. We've, I've, I've alluded to it as we've dealt through, through some other issues, but kind of want to confront it now head on. And I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And then we're going to head over to Colossians. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, in verse number 4, I want you to understand that the, that the image that we're being created in the image of God, we're talking here about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse number 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So there's an issue here of who is the image of God? We've talked about like image, right? And, 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 and what that means. And, and we know from scripture here that the image of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the, it talks here, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on to them. The problem that we have is that God created man in his own image. But now that Christ likeness is gone. And now the issue is it's been lost, but man still has this trinity that we talked about last week with the body and the soul and the spirit. And, but the problem is, is that man has this trinity, but the trinity uh, of ourselves have, has changed and that we've lost the Christ likeness. And now the spirit is dead because of sin. Sin has changed this. It has not completely destroyed it. It has, it, it has changed it, right? It has... It, it has, uh, for the worse, the, 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 the spirit is now dead. Not, nothing that man can resuscitate it, but God can. I'm just saying that it's not completely done away with, but it takes Christ to, to redeem us and to restore the image. Look at Colossians chapter number 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Verse number 1. 15 of Colossians 1 says, uh, well, let's, let's back up here. Um, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Well, that's a, that's a wonderfully succinct verse, is it not? That in Christ, we have redemption where? Through his blood, there's the cross work, even the forgiveness of our sins. There's our problem that's been dealt with, and we know how the problem has been dealt with. But look at verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one we have redemption through. And it says, who, referring to Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, if it's the firstborn of every creature, how many creatures are there? More than one. And the moment that you get saved, you become a new creature in Christ. But Christ is the firstborn because he's the one that gives you the power that all of those who come after him follow after him. Now, he is the image. We're talking about the issue of the image. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 9. So Christ is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to see God, how do you see him? Christ is the express image. 
chapter 2 and verse number 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So back in Genesis, where, when it says it created man in God's image, in whose image were we created after? We were created in the image of Christ, the image of God, and Christ being the express image of that, and in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in Hebrews chapter number 1, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, so the brightness of the glory of God is who? Christ who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And the point that I wanted to make to you there is that Christ is the express image of the person of God. And so when we are made in the image of God, we know we now have an understanding of what that's talking about. And that man is now fallen. Man in our, our current state is now fallen. But thanks to Christ, payment on the cross, we have a hope of that resurrection. If you look back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that deals with the issue of the resurrection, and you look at verse number 49, 1 Corinthians 15, 49, and as we, Paul is going to talk about our issue. Paul is dealing with the issue of the resurrection in chapter 15. And he's going to tell you about who you are and the image that you've borne. And now there's going to be a change that takes place when you trust the gospel. And now your hope has changed because your hope is no longer, you know, a dead body that's laying on the ground. And you cease to exist when this body gives out. But he says in verse number 49, And as we have borne the image of the earthly, earthy, we've borne Adam's image. We haven't borne Christ's image. We were created, Adam was created in the image of God. But we're not. We're born after our father Adam. And Paul says, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of of the heavenly. <laughs> this is all dealing with our hope. And uh, <laughs> because of that, because God created us in His image, there's a special place for us. We're going to talk later when we go through Genesis, maybe next week or the week after, about the, the purpose for which God created man and put Adam there in the garden. And God created man with a purpose, right? He, he, didn't, he didn't create without a purpose. And Adam was to have dominion because God created Adam with a privileged position. He was created in the image of God and to have dominion. And yet today what we have is that man, even though he was created higher than the animals, yet the Darwinians want to say that we're no better than the animals. And so I, I've, I've brought out this point before and I, I, I just wanted to, Circle it back again. Now you kind of understood the image being Christ and the elevated, the, you know, the elevated nature of that image and understanding the, the, the respect and the glory that's due unto Christ and knowing what awaits us. And yet man wants to come along and say that somehow like we're the same as the animals. But no, man was to have dominion over the earth and over the animals. In his image, there were attributes that were highly developed. You know, God has a self-consciousness, right? He, he is, he's able to love. He has the ability to think, the ability to understand beauty and emotion. And, and that's how Adam was created, with the ability to love God and to be able to say, this is good, and, and, and to be able to say, this is beautiful. And an absence of this understanding leads to some absurd positions, right? You see, we, we look at people in the world and we say, they're crazy, 
Well, yeah, they're crazy because their foundational assumption is not the same as yours. If I thought I was the same of the same value as a cockroach, then I, it's going to lead me to some different philosophical worldviews, is it not? I have a hard time listening to the stories coming out of Israel where they, they take babies and put them in an oven. And you say the evilness of that. And then the same people want to turn around and argue and say that what Israel is doing is wrong. And I think to myself, well, their thinking process is so warped. They don't value life. They, they don't view Israel. They don't, they don't view uh, 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 people. Uh, the people who think that we're not created in the image of God, the, the, the worldview that they, that, that they reject, the worldview that they hold to, they think that trees feel pain, that plants you know, are self-aware. They elevate all of these things. But plants and animals were not made in the image of God. And those people, they hate it when we claim that man is the pinnacle of the created order. They want to tear everything down, don't they? They say, we're no better than the other living creatures, the animals. But that's an absurd position that they don't live by. They don't live by that premise even though they promote it. What I mean by that, if we're no better than the bacteria, why do you go to the store and buy bleach and wipe down your counters? Right? I, I'm just, I know it sounds absurd, but they don't live consistent, truly consistent with the way that they feel or the way that they think. I should say, you know, the, the way that they think. If they don't think that man cr was created with a position of privilege, then why are you killing the bacteria? Or why would it matter if we kill man at all? Because he's no better than the bacteria, right? You know that there, I, I've, I've said this before, and I know I'm repeating myself, but you know that they're hypocritical because the same people who will try to tell you that we need to elevate the trees and that the trees feel pain and don't cut the trees down are the same ones who who wouldn't care less about protecting an unborn, unborn baby. So you, you, know, you know that their position is off from being consistent, and even I would go a step further than that. Being anti-God makes you evil because all good flows from God. And if you have a position that's devoid of good, you're of necessity evil. Now, the issue... Um, I'd like you to go to, to Genesis chapter number 9. I, I want to get back to the, to the image issue. Genesis chapter number 9. And the issue of God's image being important is something that you find running throughout Scripture. God takes His image seriously. Man has a particular privilege and we have worth and we have value because we're created in the image of God, and God has value. And because we're created in His image, we have value. In Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 6, Noah gets off the boat, and he says in verse number 1 of chapter number 9, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And, he, and he, he's talking to them there, and he gets down to verse number 6. Let me back up a few verses. In verse number three, he tells them that now they can eat of all the living things that there'll be meat for them. So he changed their dietary law. But he says in verse number five, and surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require, and at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Notice what he says in verse number six. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. God's not going to be putting up with murder. There was a time before Noah's flood where every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. 
I'm not saying that they didn't know that it was wrong. I think that they did. After they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you have some knowledge of good and evil, do you not? And you have a conscience which tells you what you should and should not do. But what happens to your conscience when you reject God and you think your own way? Scripture says you start to sear it with an iron. And what happens after you sear it with an iron and you're just living according to your conscience and your conscience is now gone? What's, what's to prevent you from going out and doing evil towards others? There's nothing. There's nothing to prevent you from doing that. And so that's why we as dispensationalists will come to here in Genesis chapter 9 and we say, here's some issue of human government being added. Because now God is giving the authority to man to take man's life when he takes another man's life. And he says, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For, here's the reason why you'll shed another man's blood if he sheds someone else's blood. Here's the reason why you should put to death anyone who kills another person. For in the image of God made he man. That's why. Um... <clears throat> If you had a leader in the country and you start disrespecting them, disrespect will lead to more disrespect, right? And more disrespect till eventually that leader could be undermined. God is holy and he is good and he is perfect. And so therefore there should be no undermining of God and there should be no defaming God and there should be no killing of anything that God made in his own image. Man has a problem. If you go back to Genesis chapter number 5, his problem is sin. Look at Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. So in whose likeness, in whose image? He was made in God's image. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. That's why it says there, and called their name Adam. That's why I now present to you, Mr. and Mrs., and you call them by the name. They, the two become one. Verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years. And here's the problem. <laughs> and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. He had this son after the fall. And the problem is, is that his son was not created in the image of God, but he begat a son in his own likeness after his image. And so now that original image that God had is no longer intact. There's a problem, and the problem is sin. It's been distorted. It's been perverted. Adam bears sin in his own fallen condition. The child is not born perfect because he inherits the traits of his father. And I'm safe to say in our experiment, my three sons have borne that out perfectly, and I can attest to you that the Scripture is accurate and valid when it says that they're born after the image of their father and they sin, some of them more than others. Now the image problem includes the issue that sinners can only produce what? Sinners. You remember in chapter number one when I took the time to really emphasize and point out to you that the trees bear after their own kind? And God made the animals, and they bear after their own kind. And now you have man in their fallen state, and they come together, and they procreate, and they don't pr produce perfection. That's why, the, that's why the stinking lie of evolution is such a, such a laugh. Because man devolves. He doesn't get better. <laughs> we don't produce perfection. So sinners can only produce sinners. That's why that verse that we read previously, if I, if I go back on the slide here, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, 
I wanted the verse from 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe I, Oh, there it is. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Because Christ is the firstborn of every creature. And because Christ is perfect. And because when we trust Him and Christ makes us something new, and Christ makes us a new creature, when we're born after that, when we're changed after Christ, we can become perfect. But not from our earthly father. From our earthly father, we inherit problems. Nothing but problems. Um, Genesis chapter number 5 here is known as the, the graveyard chapter. It says here, and Adam lived an hundred years, you know, and he, he begat Seth. And the days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And he died. And then you have the next person, and guess what happened to him? He died. And the next person, and the next person. And you show up over in Matthew chapter number 1, and what do they do? They give the lineage of Christ, of everyone that came before him. And guess what? Every single one of them died too, because they were all born of an earthly father. And what I'm just telling you is that you, the, the, the whole issue of the image is important to know who you were, who you were, how, how God had made you, who you are in Adam. That's the issue of sin. And now who you are in Christ and that image being restored. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. That's a, that's a glorious promise that we didn't deserve. I don't even fully understand it. I, I don't know, I don't fully comprehend what it's going to be like to bear that image. I don't. We could sit here and we could talk about some verses and we could talk about some words that we try to communicate in the English language and we know the definitions for those words and we know what's being said, but I don't fully understand it. It's, it's something that's so glorious that it's, it, it's outside of my ability to be able to comprehend, even though I know the definition of the words. We were created by God as free moral agents. Over in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, Lo, this only one, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. God made us upright, but then God creates us as free moral agents. And I firmly believe that the reason he did that is he gave Adam and Eve the ability to choose. Because they had to have the ability to love God. In order to have the ability to love him, they also had to have the ability to reject him. Or else the love would have been coerced. And the love would not have been freely given. There's an issue of volition within man that God created you in such a way that you could choose to commune with him or you could choose to reject him. God loves his creation so much that he gave his only son to die to restore that communion and that fellowship with man. There's, there's pleasure in sin for a season, but man will only truly be fulfilled and satisfied by having Christ's image become their own image, to be restored to perfection. The lie of the world today is that tolerance and acceptance of your sinful self-image of who they are. It's so godless, right? Right? Men with men and women with women and boys being girls and girls being boys and all of that wickedness. And they tell you to just be true to who you are. Well, that's obviously satanic, is it not? I shouldn't be who I am. I should be Christ-like. My image is fallen. Why should we be who we are? The only reason to continue being who you are is to continue in your sins. That's no place to be. There's a marred image that needs to be restored. The lie of the world is that the world wants man to accept their counterfeit, 
fallen image. They want you to be complacent in your sin and accept this satanic counterfeit and the fall. And all of mankind has this fallen self-image because of sin. And people can sense their incompleteness without God, can they not? I mean, they don't come right out and tell you, but you just, you just see it in the world. The, the people who are devoid of God, who go after and they, what, what, do, they, what do they strive after? They strive after drugs and, and, and physical intimacy and all of these things to try to fill up the desire that they have in their soul. And at the end of the day, they look for wealth, everything they can do to find, fill the void. And at the end of the day, what, what do they have? Nothing. Nothing. And you see them and they're, and they're miserable. I, I, don't, I don't glory in that. I'm not happy about it. I'm just saying you can see the people who live a life and their life is somewhat in the spotlight where maybe you know some details about them and you just see, well, they, they went into alcoholism and they went into this and they went into that and just nothing fills the void. They're fallen. They need Christ. And the lie of the world just tells you you're perfect just the way you are. <laughs> You'll die an early death thinking that. And you'll spend eternity apart from God. You see, I think that that Satan lie, Satan's lie, getting people to harden their hearts against God, to be complacent with who they are and in their sin, and to just think, well, everybody should accept me for the way that I am, even though I'm a pervert or, a, or, or, or whatever it may be. You don't accept sin because it's sin and people shouldn't accept the way that they are when they're in a fallen, marred image of Adam. Adam's image is the fallen image that's inherited. And if you accept your self-image in Adam, then you have no need of a savior, right? If I should be accepted just the way that I am, then everyone should accept me. And if God doesn't accept me, then he's a mean God. And who would ever want to serve a God like that? There's only one person that can mend the marred image. There's only one person that can make us whole. There's only one way to be made complete. And that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll close with Colossians chapter number 2 tonight. Colossians chapter number 2. We read verse number 9, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And verse number 10 then comes along and says, That very person in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, the very next verse comes along and says, And ye are complete in Him. It is not until that we are in Him that we're made complete. You're not complete by trying to be who you are on the inside. You're only made complete by trusting the gospel and having the Holy Spirit come within you. Having Christ change your life. So you're not complete until you're in Christ. And then once you are in Christ and made complete, let me ask you a question. If it's the person who in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're in him, what are you lacking? Nothing. In him dwelleth all the fullness. Not some of it. All of it. And the fullness of the Godhead, you get to be made a partaker of, and you come in and you have a position of complete completion. That, that issue of the marred image is then corrected. And now you stand complete in Christ, having no need, for your Savior has provided for them all. So the, from the very time of Genesis chapter number 1, when God created man in, in his image, and then the fall happens a short time later, from that very time, the thing that man has needed and what they've been waiting for is what the Apostle Paul preached about what Christ does for us and that we bear the image of the heavenly 
and that we're made complete in Christ. Christ solves all of our problems. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your son who has died and paid for all of our sins, restored us, redeemed us, justified us. May we continue to look to your word to fully understand what it means to be complete in him. In Christ's name we pray, amen.